everybody. We got a great one today, you know, for a change, but also a a depressing one because Catherine Rampell, the Washington Post columnist who writes about economics, will analyze what Donald Trump's plans for a second term would mean for average Americans. Here's a few hints. Enormous tariffs, 10% across the board on products from China. Now, let's let's make something clear, as Catherine makes clear. 10% tariffs on Chinese goods makes Chinese goods more expensive. 10% more expensive. We pay the tariffs. The Chinese don't pay the tariffs. We do. Who's ever importing it pays the tariffs. Trump even talked about 100% tariffs on Chinese cars coming through Mexico. Okay, no American will buy a Chinese car then. But China will put a huge tariff on our cars. This means Chinese won't buy our cars. Okay, fine. Here's the craziest thing Trump wants to do. Deport 12 or 14, he changes the numbers, undocumented immigrants. 12 or 14 million undocumented immigrants deported. According to Catherine, that will have a devastating effect on our economy. As our workforce has been aging, we need these immigrants, documented or undocumented, to do the jobs that aging American workers can no longer do. Other bad news, Trump wants to renew his tax cut from 2017, the one that drove up the deficit another $1.9 trillion, mainly from tax cuts going to the highest income earners and corporate execs selling their stock options. This was always a very unpopular tax cut because it barely helped low-income folks and benefits disproportionately wealthy Americans. Again, exploding the deficit by $1.9 trillion. So, not enough workers, big tax cuts for those at the top, exploding deficits, Americans pay more for goods. Here's another thing. Americans don't really understand the economy. Half of all Americans believe we are currently in a recession. We added over 200,000 jobs last month. We, We have had job growth every month during the Biden administration. Well, look, there's some good news here. The good news is that our economy is doing much better than people give it credit for. The bad news is that people don't believe it. One last thing. We recorded this just before the new employment numbers came out. The new employment number is 4%, which is still very good, but it's the first time at 4% uh, for over two years. Well, Catherine Rampell is our guest today, and you're going to get a lesson in economics and political opinion. It's a great one, but a little depressing. You know, for a change. Immigrants are good for the economy, right? Yes. We've discussed that before, and Trump says that what he'll do is um, deport 14 million. Is that what his number is? I feel like every time he talks about it, the number goes up. It's, you know, like every time he talked about building the wall, the wall got a foot higher. It's it's similar. It's like he wants to deport all of the immigrants, whether those who are documented or undocumented. Besides like a humanitarian tragedy for Mm -hmm. the individual. Oh, oh, there's that. There's that. (laughs) Um, Particularly if if this plan is executed in the way that Trump has described, which means using the military to detain immigrants in in concentration camps. None of that stuff is good, just getting that out of the way. But in terms of outcomes for the economy, um, which is what voters apparently care about, not the humanitarian and moral stuff, it would also be terrible. There has been quite a bit of research to draw on about what happens if you suddenly reduce the number of workers, for example, who are available. And you're likely to have, you know, people complain about worker shortages now, right? You're likely to have huge worker shortages, probably major supply chain issues, uh, including in critical sectors like agriculture, where immigrants are overrepresented. That's likely to lead to price increases. 
among other things. I mean, and we've seen sort of the reverse version of this, right? We've seen the benefits recently of having an influx of immigrants. And for some reason, like new, this is not convenient for either political party to talk about. But <laughs> for example, <laughs> the Congressional Budget Office just revised upward its forecasts for economic growth because immigration has been higher than they had previously assumed it would be, which means immigrants are more likely to be working age. So they're, they're more workers that helps fill jobs, that people are, man- manpower is important, right? Especially when the native born population is disproportionately aging and retiring. So you need more workers. So you need someone who might want to learn how to fix a diesel engine when people who fix diesel engines or, are 80. Yeah, take care of the elderly for the, you know, when mm-hmm. the diesel engine mechanic or whatever retires and needs some home health care, it is helpful to have working age immigrants who are willing to take those jobs and who want to take those jobs. Whenever I talk about this, the sort of anti-immigrant right, and to some extent, the anti-immigrant populist left says, oh, you just want to like import a class of slave laborers. Uh, oh, right, and I'm, right. I'm not suggesting that at all. These are people who want to come to the United States and contribute their talents and energies and support their families because there are better opportunities here. And I think we should have, obviously, like minimum <laughs> labor standards and, and wages and, and all of all of that good stuff. So I'm not suggesting we should like import a class of people to be our servants. These are people who, who want economic opportunity. And they get and they get them, and then they have children who uh, get educated and are end up being doctors and, and yeah. um, lawyers and politicians and and businessmen. Yeah, there was actually an interesting study from the um, there's the, the National Academies puts out these big like consensus reports every few years about some major issue like how do you solve child poverty or whatever, and it's usually like a a group of experts across the political spectrum. Anyway, they put out one of these things a few years ago about the economic and fiscal impact of immigrants. And they found that the children of immigrants, so I guess you'd call that first generation Americans or second generation Americans, depending on your terminology, they are among the most productive workers in the country. Um, <laughs> as measured by like how much they pay in taxes relative to how much they receive in benefits, for example, um, and and all sorts of, of other metrics suggesting that they are like really economically valuable people. Again, setting aside all of the rest of their humanity, which matters too. I just see them as cogs in the economy. <laughs> yeah, well. And what's good for the economy is good for me. Yeah, I wish uh, Trump voters Felt that way. <laughs> Felt that way. If, if you're going to dehumanize people, at That's least. That's a good way to do it. Yes, at least correctly assess their value economically, you know? And their parents uh, pay taxes all throughout their careers and very often don't get Social Security. Is that correct? So if someone is undocumented, they generally cannot receive any benefits. They pay into the system, but they pay Social Security taxes, payroll taxes and and Medicare taxes, but they cannot take them out. They can't receive food stamps. They can't receive Medicaid, et cetera, et cetera. That's for the undocumented population. I think that there is like a lot of confusion about, oh, all these people are coming into the country illegally and then they're stealing all of our benefits. No, they, they they cannot access those benefits. People who are here legally can access some benefits, but generally only after they've been here for a while, like if they have a green card for example, which takes a while for most people. Again, that that report I talked about from the National Academies, they looked at how much immigrants, including those who are who are here legally, pay into the federal government versus how much they take out and they pay much more in. Just doesn't make sense if we deport fourteen million that this will do a number on our economy. Yeah, I mean it it will. <laughs> it will be very painful. Again, this is not like the only bad economic idea that Trump has proposed that would prop. I know you're really surprised that would probably uh, worsen inflation and uh, hurt economic growth and hurt. Well, how about putting tariffs, tariffs on everything? 
yeah, the global tariffs, um, which would make things much more expensive. Now, now Trump has this thing where he keeps saying that the Chinese paid so many hundreds of billions of dollars in tariffs. And if that comes up in the debate, I want Biden to explain tariffs. But could you do it to our... Sure. Biden's in a trick. Yeah, Biden's in a little bit of a tricky... Because he's he's putting on tariffs on yep. some stuff that uh, he shouldn't be putting, like electric yes. cars and from China and that, those kind of things. Yeah, so I'll get to that in a second. But there's been a bunch of studies looking at Trump's many rounds of tariffs, and Trump did a, like a whole bunch of these, as listeners may remember, on steel, aluminum, solar panels, lots of consumer products from China washing machines. I'm sure I'm forgetting other things. Probably TVs. Uh, Did he do an additional tariff on TV? If they were from China, I think he did. So he he put all of these tariffs in place. And he said at the time, China's going to pay them. Don't worry. And then economists like actually looked at the data to figure out who paid them, right? Because the, the costs get passed on. They're actually remitted by the importers, like so if I import whatever, uh, some steel from another country, I have to pay the tariff. Right. And then pass it on to whomever you're selling it right. to. Right. So the question is like how much of it gets passed on down the line. And there were a whole bunch of these studies uh, like from really respected people, different political leanings that basically all found that the tariffs were paid either mostly or entirely by Americans. They were passed along to American businesses and or American consumers. Trump's explanation of what was going on, what would happen here, unsurprisingly, did not actually happen. And Biden actually pointed that out at the time. If you look back at statements that he made in 2019, 2020, when he was running for president, he repeatedly said, like, I want to be tough on China, but this isn't the way to do it. All you're doing is raising costs for American consumers and killing American jobs, which is true, uh, especially since like some of the things that I mentioned are inputs into stuff American companies make. So like if you make steel more expensive, that, that helps the really small population of steel workers, maybe. But what about the people who are employed by companies that make cars or <laughs> appliances or anything else? Yeah, like an appliance. Well, let's say a TV. So yeah. you put a tariff on it and that gets added to the price of the TV. So an American who pays the tariff. Right. Um, but I'm saying it's like not only the consumers who are affected, but also the American workers who maybe need to what, buy What, you're talking about raw inputs. material. Right, 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 right. Like that's especially true for for the the steel tariffs. Anyway, so Biden pointed all of this out at the time. Then what happened when he got into office? He basically kept all of Trump's tariffs in place or just swapped them out for some some other kind of trade restriction and now has announced even more tariffs. It's weird because like Biden and his aides will frequently make comments criticizing Trump for announcing more tariffs, you know, or proposing more tariffs, like, oh, this is going to be really bad for inflation. It's like, well, but like you understand that they're bad when he does it, but then you don't understand that it's bad when you do it or when you keep his thing. The Biden folks will say, oh, our tariffs are much more targeted. Um, (laughs) Okay. So he doesn't have a clean hit in the debate then. Yeah. I I, I think that's the case. Okay. Now, the Republicans want to renew the 2017 tax cut. When is that set to expire? The individual provisions, so like the lower tax rates for regular American households and the bigger standard deduction and stuff like that, that all expires next year, 2025. Now, this was not a popular tax cut. Correct. Um, (laughs) If you look look at polling on the tax cut, it was basically always underwater. Um, meaning that Americans were much more likely to disapprove of it than approve of it. Some of that is, uh, to be fair, about some misperceptions about the tax cut. I think it was a bad policy. Now, why? It was heavily weighted toward the wealthy. It wasn't paid for. There, there you go. Yeah, and you know, it, it, like, it added to the deficit about one point nine trillion. 
Correct. You know, over 10 years. So it was very expensive. It wasn't paid for. We hear all of this like hue and cry about how important it is to get our deficits down. And meanwhile, they added $2 trillion. By, especially by the Republican Party. Especially by the Republicans, yes. And then you see like they're just like, sure, we'll add $2 trillion to the deficit. Now, the misperception I mentioned is that most Americans actually did get a tax cut from this, including the middle class, lower income people. It was much smaller as a share of their income than the tax cuts. As a share of their income. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In dollar terms and as a share of their income than high income people got. But most people are like, oh, I didn't get anything from it. Uh, Only the rich got something from it. It's actually true that like everybody got something. It's just the rich got even more. Our tax code is really illegible. Like it's hard to figure out what your tax rate is. So if you ask Americans, if you ask Americans, and I'm talking about even Trump voters and Republicans, won't they say that those in upper income earners should pay more in taxes? Yes. That's the one thing I don't understand from Trump voters, which is, do they understand what the bargain is when you have that kind of tax cut? I don't know if they care, to be honest. It seems like e- economics is something that people really care about and, and their own economics. They say they do. I want to ask you about a column you wrote about what Americans understand about the economy. And it was pretty shocking. The one that wasn't shocking is on inflation. When was this done? This, this, uh, the, survey? the survey? I think it was like in the past month. And most Americans said that inflation is going up. And I can understand that, them saying that. The rate of inflation is going down. That means inflation is going down, right, technically. But if the price of stuff you're paying is going up, you think inflation is going up. That's kind of a, a natural thing to say. Yeah, I think it's it's like economists and normal people use the term inflation very differently. Economists mean the pace of growth of price increases. Right. Normal people mean like the level of prices. And this is like a really dumb, wonky difference, right? Like normal Americans will say, hey, a gallon of milk is, you know, a few years ago was like, I don't know, I'm lactose intolerant, I don't buy milk. So let's say it was like three bucks a gallon, and then it went up to four bucks a gallon. I love it's... lactose, by the way. And you I, do? And I still don't know what the price but of a gallon Jewish. is. Yeah. I okay. know. I'm not lactose intolerant. Okay. Well, you're, you're one of the, the chosen few among the chosen few. In any event, so like Americans might say, okay, it was three bucks, then it was four bucks a gallon, and now it, it's still four bucks a gallon. And when is it going to go back to $3? Damn you, inflation. Economists would say it went up from $3 a gallon to $4 a gallon, but it stayed steady at 4 bucks a gallon. That's success, right? Because it hasn't continued increasing. The, the, the goal of the Federal Reserve is not to get it to go down. It's to get it to stop increasing as much. Okay. So I forgive Americans for saying inflation is going up when, in fact, it's not going up in terms of the rate of increase in it. So that I completely understand. But there are other things like they thought we were in a recession and we're not in a recession. They thought that employment was down, right? If you look at the numbers, they think unemployment is at a 50-year high, which it is absolutely not. It is close to the opposite. It is below four, right? Right. It's been below 4% for over two years. The last time... We had unemployment that good for that long was when Nixon was president. If you ask people, like, do you think stock markets are up or down since the beginning of the year? They think they're down, even though we've actually hit record high levels for stock markets. Like I said, inflation, even recession, I think it's partly just like, what does the word mean to different people? That's more forgivable. It's just a it's a, a usage difference. On these things like... Whether the stock market is up or down, I don't know how to spin that as like maybe people mean something different. No, it is objectively wrong that stock markets are down or that unemployment is high when it is actually very, very low in historical terms. Sort of historical lows. 
Yes. Yeah. So what's the explanation for this? Why do people have these misconceptions? I would explain it a few different ways. One is that views of the economy are much more partisan than they used to be. People are more likely to rate the economy poorly when their party's out of office. And so the numbers among Republicans are especially bad in terms of how they view all these different economic metrics. But that can't explain everything because the numbers among Democrats are also pretty bad. So it's not only that. I think it's also that the media, those of us in the in the journalism business, has not been great about talking as much about the good numbers as we were at talking about the bad numbers. So there's a bias toward reporting bad news. Yes. Yes. And that's always been true. That's always, always been true. You know, the idea that if it bleeds, it leads. If you're watching MSNBC, they'll show the good news. And if you're watching Fox, they'll show the bad news. Or you're uh, not so I sure, I see. I don't know. Um, I'm sure that's true. I'm, I'm sure it's true of Fox. With MSNBC, I wonder how much coverage they've given to the good news. I, I'm sure it's more than Fox, but I haven't done an analysis Well, when it. the stock market goes, you know, hits a new yeah. high, they go ding, 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 ding. Yeah. Look at this. Yeah. yeah. And yet, and yet, Bidenomics. What a bad uh, idea that was. Yeah, well. As a campaign slogan. This was at a point where I know exactly what happened. They went like, look, we're not going to go into a recession. And the stock market is at record highs. And yet our growth continues. That's a miracle. And you know what? That miracle is Bidenomics. And then they just start doing Bidenomics at a point where Americans are, their feelings about the economy are what this poll reflects, right? Yeah, it was kind of the same issue that Obama faced in, uh, I guess this is like around 2011, 2012, when he was running for re-election, was that he was talking about how much the economy had improved from its deep dark depths from the Great Recession and the financial crisis, but people still felt pretty lousy. And so the whole thing seemed kind of tone deaf. Yeah, well, that's why that was going to be a close election and why we were nervous. (laughs) Yeah. And so I think I, I genuinely think the Biden administration is in a difficult spot. Like, how do you talk about the good news without making it sound like you're tone deaf and you're dismissing Americans' real concerns. Because like I said, some of these things, like people are just wrong about the stock market. I I think they are valid to be upset about grocery prices going up, whether it's milk or anything else. Even if grocery prices have like kind of flattened out. And if you look at the numbers year over year, they're, they're basically flat. There had been so much growth before that, that people do get sticker shock every time that they go to the supermarket. And I don't think it's really like, useful or productive to tell people your feelings aren't valid. No, I think that's, that's always, uh, when I was in office, that's what I used to say to voters. Your feelings aren't valid. (laughs) Things are much better. don't care about your feelings. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, So I think it's hard. I don't know what the right messaging is. And I, as I said, the, the media coverage has been biased toward the negative, but that's largely because our audiences are biased toward the negative. And so people love to hate on the media, and we we should be doing better. But the problem is that when we talk about good news, people don't want to read it or listen to it as much. I mean, like I can see this in my own traffic numbers, that when I write about something catastrophic, like it's going to get way more clicks than if I say this thing was good. And <laughs> obviously, like I shouldn't let that drive what I choose to write about or how I choose to write it. But on some subconscious level, it's going to affect every journalist, no matter how principled we think we are. So my argument is always, look, if you're pissed off about how news coverage is so negative, then reward the stuff you want with your attention. Like click on and share the stuff that you say you want more of from the media rather than just bitching about it. 
like actually help change our incentives. That's such a hard ask. But like, I know that people are more likely to share, click on and share, you know, send to their families, whatever the stuff that I write about how something is terrible than when something is good. And I still make sure I carve out columns to write about important good news. But like, I just know, okay, that's nobody's going to read it. (laughs) <laughs> but, but I think it's part, you know, I I have a platform with some responsibility. I'm still going to try to, you know, use whatever influence I have to highlight things that are good, bad, and in between. Like most news organizations, most journalists do not necessarily have the luxury of just being able to write about whatever they think is best for readers because newsrooms are shrinking, resources are scarce. And so like, Again, even if it's not a conscious decision, you're going to devote more resources when, like, you're really financially stressed to the things that you know people will read. It's a real problem. So recently, um, you wrote about Lankford voting against his own immigration bill. Yeah. Which was kind of humiliating, I think, in a in a way for him. Um, He worked so hard on that and was a champion, and it was basically a bill that met all the criteria of conservatives or of those people who want to keep people out yeah, and do something about the the crisis at the border. And it was all set to go. And then Trump didn't want things to improve. He wanted to keep them as bad as possible for his election. Yeah. The problem was much more politically useful than the cure in this particular case, as is unfortunately often the case in politics. Listeners may recall that the whole reason these bipartisan border negotiations happened was that last fall, Republicans demanded them as a concession in exchange for giving money to Ukraine and Israel, right? That was the whole fight. Biden and the Democrats wanted to give money, uh, give aid to Ukraine as well as Israel, which had more bipartisan support. And Republicans said, no, 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 we refuse um, unless you do these like really hardcore border things that we want. Negotiations stretched on for a while. Democrats basically gave up the store. There were a number of Democrats who voted against it. Well, yes, but I'm saying like in terms of the negotiations that led up to the vote, Republicans got pretty much everything that they wanted um, on border security. I mean, there are a lot of things that Democrats, I I guess I should clarify, like a lot of Democrats are in favor of having more funding for border patrol and and asylum judges, asylum judges. There were like changes to the asylum system that a lot of progressives were unhappy with. But like they were in favor of some of this stuff. But in terms of their biggest priorities, things like getting permanent legal status for dreamers, Dreamers, for example, that was completely missing. All of the stuff that Democrats usually want as as part of like a grand bargain on immigration, that was gone. Instead, it was all border security stuff. Then Republicans like got everything they wanted in their hard bargain and then couldn't take yes for an answer because Trump said, no, don't vote for this. And then they kind of like had to twist themselves into knots to explain why after demanding these concessions, they didn't want them. And they kept on saying, well, Biden can just use existing law to do all this stuff. And it's like, well, then why did you demand that (laughs) this other law get negotiated? (laughs) Whatever. It was completely incoherent. Since then, separately, the funding for Ukraine and Israel went through. And then subsequently, Democrats were like, okay, Like, we'll just give you the stuff you asked for Mm. uh, separately because, like, the stuff we wanted has already gone through and and Republicans, including Lankford, who negotiated that deal, voted against it. The first time they had a vote for it, which was, I want to say, like, back in... He voted for it the first time? Yeah, he did. And he gave, actually, this very moving speech. Like, all all of his Republican colleagues, or almost all of them, voted against it. And he was like, we've been sent here to solve problems and I can like give speeches anywhere in the country, but it's only here on Capitol Hill in the Senate that we can actually solve this problem. And I wish we could solve this problem now. But it was like a pretty um, 
Emotional, compelling yeah. speech. Yeah. About like he wanted to fix a problem and voters had sent him there to fix a problem. And he was so frustrated that his party was not fixing the problem. And then uh, again, like the Israel Ukraine stuff went through. Schumer brought the bill back to the same bill back to the floor, uh, you know, unbundled with the Ukraine stuff a couple of weeks ago. And this time, even Lankford voted against it. That's pretty sad. It is. It felt very humiliating, I think, is the right word. I mean, I don't know that Lankford would use that word, but it just there isn't even an attempt to try to solve problems at all. Even the problems that Republicans claim to be most concerned with. And and actually, um, Biden is announcing that he is going to try to unilaterally do some of the things that were in that bill. Just like Republicans said, oh, he can just do this on his own. The problem is, you know, like the shutting down the border and stuff like that. The problem is that Trump tried to do them and courts found them to be illegal without having a new law. So Biden is now like, I don't know if you want to say calling their bluff or what, but Biden is now saying, okay, you told me I could do this without you're actually passing a law that I have the authority to do it. I'm going to try to do it, but it's almost certainly going to get blocked in courts again, just like it was under Trump. So what are the stakes in this election? I mean, we have the Senate in play, certainly, and the House in play. I mean, that's a very, very thin margin. I'm most concerned about who fills the White House, kind of regardless of who controls the Senate and the House, because I think there's a lot of bad stuff that Trump would do in a second term with or without the help of Congress. But obviously, it would be worse if you had no even attempt to check his power uh, because Republicans had a trifecta next year. And and that would be unimaginably worse. But the stakes are, are very high, even if it's only Trump in the White House and Democrats somehow managed to control both chambers of Congress, which I don't think is likely to happen. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm very concerned. We've talked about economic stuff, obviously, and, and that's pretty bad, especially since that's what voters claim to care about. But I'm much more concerned about other forms of democratic backsliding. You know, what happens to civil rights? What happens to uh, rule of law? Corruption. Corruption. You know, Trump already tried to steal everything that wasn't nailed down when he was president before. I think it'll probably be worse next time around. Have you looked into uh, how much he gained, how much money that he gained while he was president? I know that there have been some estimates for like how much he got from the Secret Service. I'm not aware of a comprehensive number for all of the other stuff that he got because I think they're it's just not transparent. Like. All of the times the Saudis stayed at his Hotel. various properties. Oh, yeah. And yeah, like I think that there have been, correct me if I'm wrong, if there has been a, a really good comprehensive attempt, I'm not aware of it, but there have been these sort of piecemeal looks at how much he got from individual transactions. Th- that's part of the problem here. It's like he doesn't disclose his tax returns. He doesn't disclose things that are probably even more significant than what's on his tax returns, like who he owes money to and at what rates, because there are lots of ways to hide a bribe that don't involve a direct payment. So yeah, it's all this stuff is really bad. And although surprisingly, like as opaque as he's been on some of like these core issues, he has been like sort of flippantly open about other kinds of quid pro quos. Like there have been a bunch of examples where he did fundraisers recently where he told oh, the oil guys. Yeah, he told the the oil execs that they I forget what the he was like just give me a billion like, dollars. Give me a billion dollars and, <laughs> and um it'll be really good for the oil industry. They'll get a great deal, I think was the word that I saw in reporting <laughs> because <laughs> He'll help them out with tax breaks and deregulation. Deregulation particularly. <laughs> And uh, there was some other reporting say- recently saying that he'll let all of their mergers and acquisitions sail through without scrutiny. And so, like, yeah, there probably a billion dollars could be 
a great exchange <laughs> for them <laughs> if they're really – I mean, it depends what they're maximizing, I guess. Like if they're maximizing their short-term profits, good for them. The problem is that when you put an authoritarian – a fickle authoritarian, no less, in office – like that's probably not good for your bottom line in the long run, because at the point that you degrade rule of law, that you have an economy that's no longer about letting markets decide who was a winner or a loser, as Republicans normally claim that they want to happen, but rather who's bribing or whatever, you know, the best best buddies, who's closest with the president, that has a lot of distortions. And frankly, like, Trump is not a reliable counterparty for these things. Like you give him a billion dollars now, maybe he gives you your tax breaks or whatever. But what happens if you get caught like on a hot mic at a party sometime saying something about his ties or whatever? You know, he's a a very vengeful guy. And even before he was president, like he was well known for never keeping his end of a bargain. He, He stiffed every granite countertop salesman and, you know, other small contractor he dealt with. Pianos. Yeah. Like the chandelier guy, you know, for Trump casinos or whoever, like there's like a, a list of lawsuits miles and miles long that prove that he is not a reliable negotiating partner. So the fact that like these industrial titans and billionaires and whatever are like, oh, whatever, like he's transactional, we can control him. We'll give him a billion dollars and we'll, we'll get it billion. back many fold. Maybe they will. Like best case scenario for them, not for the rest of us, is maybe they will. But like you cannot take this guy at his word. Why would you think that, okay, we can, we can ride the tiger and we can manage this guy is, is really <laughs> a, a re- Yeah, like <laughs> – that this is a reliable relationship. The, the column that, that I, I wrote about this a while ago was like, you know, anyone who would trade democracy for a little financial gain is probably going to get neither in the end, right? If you put an authoritarian in office because you think you can manage him, you know, that he's transactional enough that like you can, you can get your, your quids and quos in order maybe that'll work, but you may end up degrading the quality of the economy and the conditions of the business sector so much. You know, we no longer enforce fraud, for example. We no longer enforce contracts unless you're a, a friend of of the top guy in, in the Oval Office. That leads to bad outcomes. This is why it's better to do business in the United States than it is in a place like Russia right. or, or in China because we have rule of law. And why people like to do business in the United right. States. Right, exactly. And if you're willing to trade that away for some near-term tax breaks, uh, you are really making the wrong calculation. Again, not just on a moral level, but on a self-interested financial level. Well, that's, a, I think, a good note to end on, unless you have another note you want to end on. No, that's that's good. I'll get down off my soapbox. No, it's a good soapbox. I mean, I... I really am kind of scared about this one, and you don't need to say so because you're on the op-ed page. I I say it every week, I think, Yes. because I'm on the op-ed page. Yes. Well, thank you, Catherine. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. Well, I I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week. 